Yes, everybody. Welcome back to TarHillIllustrated.com. Or, of course, if you are watching on our fast-growing YouTube channel, that is Tar Hill Illustrated. Pushing for 10K. Going to get there soon, I'm hoping. I'm THI staff writer Jacob Turner. And joining me from Cameron Indoor Stadium in Durham, North Carolina, just down the road from Chapel Hill, our very own publisher, Andrew Jones. And AJ just saw the Tar Heels pick up the 94 to 81 victory over fourth ranked Duke in Coach K's final home game in Durham. A huge win for Carolina. I know, uh, I think some people might have saw it coming. I think a lot of people probably didn't see it coming with the way this one ended up finishing. Carolina improving to 23 and eight to finish the regular season. 15 and five in league play. Duke dropping to 26 and five, 16 and four in the ACC. So, AJ, let's dive into it. A lot of stuff to talk about with this, and I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of excited Carolina fans watching this one right now as well. Um, I, I want to talk about the first half and, and kind of how it fed into the second half to start out. Obviously, 41-39 lead for uh, the 41-39 at the break. Subs played 14 minutes in that first half. Didn't play a single minute in the second half for the Tar Heels. Armando Baycott was in foul trouble, played just 10 minutes in the first half. Caleb Love was just one for nine from the floor. Quiet, pretty unproductive first half from Caleb Love. Kind of didn't look like he was really in his bag. But R.J. Davis was big, 11 points in the first half. Kind of kept the Tar Heels in it. Obviously hit that big shot right before the half ended before both teams went in the locker room to cut it to two. So, A.J., I mean, when you looked at that stat sheet for a majority, you kind of looked at the lineup that Carolina had out there at times in that first half that, you know, there's really no business is what we've seen in the past for Carolina to be in this game with Caleb struggles, Armando in foul trouble. You know, it was a game in which we've seen a lot in the past where Carolina has struggled to keep up with good teams. That wasn't the case tonight. They were able to stick around, able to cut it to it at half, which was obviously huge for their second half performance and getting to the win. So I think in particular that end of that first half, and how it fed into Carolina's performance in the second half was absolutely critical for Carolina in this game. Okay, and pardon me for looking around a lot because they're breaking down the tables right now, so we're going to kind of zoom on through this. Dean Smith used to kind of play the first half to get to the second half sometimes, especially in big games, and I think that Carolina did that today. Armando picked up that foul about four or five, about four minutes in, five minutes in, actually a little bit longer than Hubert took him out and kept him out for an extended period of time, about five and a half minutes. And I think Carolina was ahead. So he's like, you know what? I'm going to buy some extra time, you know, extending the game before Armando can possibly get into foul trouble. I'm going to run guys out there. Puff kind of had a rough stretch. They put down Trez out there. Puff came in later, by the way, and acquitted himself. Had that nice little floater on that drive. In fact, the only point scored by any of the guys off the bench. And then it was RJ Davis. I mean, RJ was pretty good all along. But he had a nice little stretch there where he got some buckets when they needed it, especially when Duke had that 14 nothing run. And then he hit the big three at the end of the half that cut it to two points. But I'll tell you, Jacob, you know, playing the first half to get to the second half means dealing with what the other team throws at you. And because a lot of stuff wasn't working well early for Duke, they threw a lot of different things at the Tar Heels, and, and including uh, Paulo Bancaro doing his thing and driving and getting to the rim and stuff like that. But the Tar Heels punched back. That 14 nothing run looked like, okay, well, you know, that we saw what happened in Chapel Hill. Let's see if this club has the grit, if they've all had their cans of spinach before the game, if they can respond. And they did. And when they got to halftime, we kind of looked around thinking, wow, they're only down two. Armando picked up a second foul in the half, and Hubert even took them out late in the half, the last minute or so, just to play it safe. They even put DeMarco done in the game late. I mean, Hubert was trying to get to the second half and he got to the second half and it took a while, but then the Tar Heels went on a massive run late and were very impressive. But you know, the, the game isn't always about what happens when the game is decided. A lot of times, what do you do to put yourself in position to make the run that decides a game? And I thought the Tar Heels did that in the first half today. It was impressive. It was big boy basketball when they weren't playing super well in stretches and they did enough to put themselves in position to make that push later in the game. Something they didn't do in the first game at Chapel Hill. Absolutely. It was a big kind of switch of events for that. And the fact that Carolina was able to stick around through under those circumstances, I think is a, a huge plus for this team and a huge kind of sign of growth in the process, throwing that P word out real quick. I'm going to run through some stats before we dive into the second one. I know we got to keep this one quick, so I'm going to try to run through them quickly. Baycott led the way. Armando Baycott, 23 points, seven boards. 10 for 11 from the floor. Caleb Love, 22 points, five assists, five rebounds, which is four for 17 from the floor shooting, though. R.J. Davis, 21 points, five assists, four rebounds. Brady Manick, 20 points and 11 boards. 
for the graduate transfer. So double double for him. Let's talk about the second half. Carolina shot 59.4% in the second half, 48.5% for the game, only four three-pointers made from the Tar Heels, but 55 points. Um, I thought Carolina was very aggressive to the basket a couple of times. I, mean, I remember a couple of huge um, layups R.J. Davis made under with some contact under the basket to kind of help stretch Carolina's lead and, and kind of keep him that distance away from the Blue Devils. And, you know, Coach K said it, that, that his team isn't a great defensive team, but Carolina played really great. I know Carolina played well on both sides of the floor, particularly down – the stretch in the second half. I think Carolina played some really, really nice defense and was able to kind of quiet Bancaro a little bit, who was their main guy tonight, 23 points for him. And that obviously helped them pull away late and come up with the 13-point victory. Well, I asked Caleb about the success Carolina had getting Duke to switch in the second half, which allowed those drives. RJ and Caleb got big guys on them, and they drove. And they used their hips, they used their bodies, and they were able to get stuff off. And when they missed, there were enough offensive rebounds and enough opportunities that the Tar Heels had a lot of success. They had 19 dunks slash layups in the game. I think it was 15 layups, four dunks. They missed a lot of other layups, or several other layups around the rim there in the second half, but they were getting them. I think that they got into Duke. They figured out a way to draw, to go at Duke, and, that, and Duke had no answer. So the only other thing Kay could have done was go into the zone. But you're not going to go zone when Caleb loves heating up when Brady Maddox out there and RJ Davis is doing what he did earlier in the game. So Duke had to live with it and Carolina owned them in the second half. It was a clinic offensively and how to create mismatches that are your advantage and get your guards and opportunities to do positive things. You know, Caleb didn't convert a lot of those layups, Jacob, but he hit, he was 12 and 12 for the free throw line. Mm, so and by time. the way, he is now, because he went 12 for 12 today with the total number that he has in his career, he is now the all-time leading free throw shooter in Carolina history, we were told after the game. I thought it was a masterful, masterful performance. And I think maybe the best sequence that shows the grit that we were talking about, that shows the punch that this team said they didn't have in January, maybe even in early February, was that sequence where they had three offensive rebounds in one possession that ended with a bucket. And I'll tell you what, it was 61-56 Duke with 10-32 left in the game. Carolina scored 38 points over the last 10 and a half minutes of the game. They had a 34 to 15 run really to kind of take the energy out of the place. And, and here's the other observation. You know, you and I did the preview podcast and, and Brett Friedner and I did another podcast the other night. And I said, you know, all the stuff going on around here to do, you know, will that take, will that you know, have an impact on them? I think the blue devils were the tired team in the last six minutes of the game, last eight minutes of the game, not the Tar Heels. Every starter played the entire second half. Mm -hmm. Duke looked like the tired team, not Carolina. Duke was the one that was out of position, was a step late. Shots were short. Shots looked uncomfortable. Carolina was the team that looked like they were gaining energy as the game closed. So kudos to them. Kudos to Hubert Davis for all the criticism he's taken uh, from a lot of people. One thing we've known all along, David Siskel's pointing this out, the man knows how to co coach offense. The NBA yeah. is about getting mismatches creating mismatches and making the best of it. And Carolina did that in the second half tonight. Yeah, they definitely did. All right, AJ, last thing I want to hit on before we get kicked out of – before you get kicked out of Cameron Indoor. I close. Say. <laughs> Let's talk about what this means. Obviously, Carolina finished and tied for second in the ACC with the win. Notre Dame obviously getting that second seed in the tournament because of Notre Dame and that tiebreaker earlier this year. So Carolina plays Thursday at 9.30 p.m. in the ACC tournament quarterfinals, obviously secured the double bye after the win over Syracuse as well, but just not even hitting on that. This is, it's a massive win for Carolina. I mean, this is a team that has struggled so much against good teams this year. I mean, just so much against good teams. That was always kind of the, the, you know, elephant in the room for the Tar Heels. You know, they, they've beaten some good teams. They've taken care of the teams they should take care of for the most part, but they haven't been able to even compete against the good teams that you was, you know, usually um, expect Carolina to at least play well against and often beat with the pedigree of this program. So, They've got that monkey off their back, for lack of a better word. They've, they've beaten Duke in a massive game, Coach K's final game. You know, All eyes were on this game, and Duke and Coach K, and Carolina comes in there and spoils the party. Just a massive win for the Tar Heels. Carry them some momentum into the post uh, into the postseason. Who knows what can happen now, but more than anything, I think tonight is just an incredible win for the Tar Heels, one a lot of people did not expect yeah. coming into it. I got like 90 seconds here. Otherwise, they're gonna, I'm going to like fall into a sinkhole or something like that. <laughs> it was an enormous win. Carolina checked off every box tonight. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I thought Manic did a nice job in the second half on Boncaro. He had 15 in the first half. He had eight in the second half. It wasn't enough to, to, to lose the game. So he had 23 overall, but he did beat Carolina. And, and they didn't let anyone else go off. You know, some of those other guys kind of disappeared for a while. I thought it was a gritty, gritty performance by the Tar Heels, but it was also a highly skilled performance. Take, you know, if there are eight check boxes that you need to check to be a, a damn good basketball team, they checked all eight of them. They, they weren't great on the glass, but you're not going to be great on the glass in this situation. They were good enough. They were plenty good enough, especially yeah, the yeah. flurry of offensive rebounds that I talked about. Another thing, I talked in our, in our five keys for the game about special teams, getting second chance points, getting t- steals and creating scoring opportunities for yourselves. Tar Heels didn't have a great efficiency level on scoring off their own offensive rebounds and off steals, but they registered steals and they got offensive rebounds. They were doing things they haven't consistently done throughout the year that make them a more complete team. This was by far their most complete performance. This is by far their best performance. And I told you guys the last couple of weeks, they were starting to remind me of UCLA from last year. I'm not projecting that that's what they'll do moving forward. But what we saw tonight was the kind of performance that UCLA put on late last year when they went from like a five-game losing streak to turning it on and getting to the Final Four. This club has high-end dudes. And when high-end dudes are scoring and, and defending enough and are getting after getting after loose balls and creating some havoc, it's going to be a very good basketball team. We've talked a lot about the potential for this to be a very good basketball team. Tonight – they were a very good basketball team. They were locked in. They were insulated. I think they were loose. Plus, they had a chip on their shoulder tonight, and it showed in their performance. So what does this mean? It means they now know this is a high end where they can be. Now, they're going to have to be at this level the rest of the way to do anything else that's magical and special, which they're capable of doing. The question will be, how do they respond to this? That's the beautiful thing about covering a season and covering a team like this. New questions emerge after each performance. A lot of them will emerge after that, after this one. But they also answered more tonight than they have in any game this season. They're a lock for the tournament. By the way, four guys in 20 points, uh, with 20 points, first time in Carolina basketball history. Four guys scored 20 points in the same game. So they checked all the boxes. And I got to go, otherwise these people are going to kill me. <laughs> big time win. Last AJ podcast ever. I know a big time win in a big time environment, a big time game for Carolina 94 to 81. Make sure you guys keep it locked to Tar Illustrated.com. Gonna cut this one a little bit short. I've been Jacob Turner. He's been Andrew Jones. Thank See you. you guys on the next one. Thanks. Thank you.